Chapter 8, Litigation Services Provided by Accountants. This is a very interesting chapter. You'll make sure you read it in detail in the textbook. But this shows you how forensic accountants can provide services in the legal arena. Now, first of all, let's get just a little bit of background uh, about the legality of things. And the, we have here the six major phases of litigation, and they are pleadings and then discovery. We're going to talk about these first two in the next slide or two. Then you have pretrial conferences. You, you try to see where everyone stands, maybe try to settle and so forth. Then if it gets this far, you have a trial, then the outcome, and then a possible appeal. As a forensic accountant, most of the work you will do is in the discovery stage. You might end up on the witness stand at the trial stage, so you need to be prepared for that as well. Now, pleadings. First, there's the complaint, and the plaintiff files the complaint. There's the service of process, and so now the defendant is served. Answer, the defendant must state, well, I admit this, which they probably will not, or deny the allegations. Then there could be a demur, which could be thrown out because there's no cause of action, and the judge might decide this. Then you get into possible cross-complaint, the defendant might file a lawsuit against the plaintiff. Methods of discovery, and this, again, like we said earlier, is where the forensic accountant can really help out. And you can discover evidence through interrogatories, depositions, admission of facts. You might request for production certain documents, and then you might have to subpoena certain documents or evidence. And you, I'm, I'm talking about your side, you know, the attorney will do this. But you can help the attorney find out, you know, what do you need to subpoena? You know, what documents do you need? The types of litigation services, you can be a consultant. Now, this is where you, you are helping an attorney out on either the plaintiff side or the defense side. But you're not going to be identified as an expert witness. So you will not testify. You will not produce a report that the other side will see. You're working only for the attorney to be so sort of the attorney's consultant okay now the expert witness though that's this is a large step up this is where you will work for your side again the plaintiff or the defendant you will prepare reports you will evaluate uh, evidence you will discuss things with the attorney you're working for you might end up testifying either in deposition or on the witness stand you know, in the courtroom also, you'll prepare a report that everyone's going to see. You'll file it with the court, and the other side will have a copy of this. The third category could be court-appointed experts and special masters, and these come into play when uh, the court, like the judge, needs an expert to help wade through technical material or a lot of numbers or whatever. Okay, so that's an, an, uh, a situation you get into where you're not working for the plaintiff or the defendant, you're working for the court itself. Now, these are things you need to have if you're going to be an expert witness. You need to possess the skills, knowledge, experience, education, and training. You have to have that. You just cannot accept a case um, unless you really have this, this background, you know, this experience. You need to follow any professional codes that you're under. Like the AICPA has professional codes of conduct. You cannot have any conflicts of interest. You need to be completely free of any indication of conflicts of interest. And then as an expert, you will prepare a written agreement to perform litigation services. What you're going to do here is this is like an engagement letter with the attorney you're going to work for. You need to be very, very clear what your product is going to be and who can use it. Two types of witnesses. A lay witness, also called a fact witness, testifies only as to facts, facts that they know. They are not going to express an opinion. Now, an expert witness, this is where the forensic accountant comes in, is an individual who, because of specialized training or experience, is allowed to testify in court to help the judge or jurors understand complicated and technical subjects. And the expert witness 
in many cases, will express an opinion, like an opinion about the amount, the estimated amount of business damages, or an opinion on the value of a business. Then you can have a summary witness, and just like the title says, someone is brought in just to summarize a lot of complex data. Now to qualify an expert witness, there are two standards that uh, witnesses fall under. There's the old Fry standard. I shouldn't say old because some states still use this standard. And there's the Daubert standard we're going to talk about in just a minute. Now under the Fry standard, you know, you can be admitted as an expert witness in these categories. Whether the expert's testimony will assist the trier of fact, the judge, in understanding the evidence, or in determining a fact and issue. Also, the second one, whether the theories and or techniques relied upon by the expert are generally accepted by the relevant professional community. And the third one, whether the particular expert is qualified to present expert testimony on the subject at issue. These sound good. The uh, Daubert standard we'll look at in a minute. Sort of add to these. Now, the Federal Rules of Evidence gives the judge the power as sort of like a gatekeeper. And the judge will decide whether the accountant can be allowed to, be, to testify as an expert witness. So it's up to the judge. So you have to convince the judge that you're qualified. What will the judge look, look at? The accountant's testimony will, will help jurors or the judge understand the evidence or determine a fact and issue. Okay, that makes sense. The accountant is qualified as an expert by knowledge, skill, experience, training, or education. That also sounds good. And the accountant can show that his or her testimony, A, will be based on sufficient facts or data. Okay, you need to make sure that you have good basis for your testimony and your opinion. And B, will be the product of reliable principles and methods that have been applied reliably, reliably to the facts of the case. Then get into the Daubert principles. The Daubert comes from the name of a court case at the U.S. Supreme Court, established the rules uh, for you know, allowing experts, and then the Kumho Tire Company, in that case, the Supreme Court added another uh, requirement. So these five requirements are, and Daubert, whether the testimony or technique in question can be and has been tested, whether the theory or technique in question has been subject, subjected to peer review and publication, whether the theory has a higher error rate. This is mainly in the science area. The next one, whether there are standards controlling the technique's operation. And the last one, whether the theory or technique has attracted widespread acceptance within the relevant community. So all these five must be met under the Daubert standard. The federal courts use the Daubert standard. Uh, a good number of state courts use the Daubert standard, but also a good number of state courts use the old Fry standards. Now, testifying at deposition. Here you're going to be, a deposition is um, testimony, testimony under oath. The other side will probably be asking all the questions, and they're going to try to fill you out. How good a witness will you be? Are you qualified? So they're going to ask all these things you see on the, see on the screen. Plus, they might ask about these, past publications and lectures, fields and what you're qualified for, uh, compensation, get down to the bottom, opinions, basis for opinions, and details about the report that you have filed for the court case. And so they will question you quite a bit in the deposition. Again, no judge or jury is present. This is before trial, and it's to see, it's to let the other side see, again, how well you're prepared and how you will look on the witness stand as an expert witness. Getting the court testimony. These are a whole list of things. I'm not going to read all these. Um, again, just, just be professional. Be careful who you talk to when you're outside the courtroom. Um, let me go down about halfway. Be sure your attorney questions you in detail about your qualifications in order to impress the judge and or juror, jurors. Why do that? Well, look at the next sentence. Do not allow the other side to stipulate you as an expert. If the other side says, okay, 
I'll accept him or her as an expert. That, you know, let's not talk about it, anything else. That doesn't give you the opportunity to impress who you need to impress that you are very qualified. So make sure your attorney sets you up and makes you look very, very good in front of the judge and or jury. Let's see here. Uh, just be careful. Explain things clearly. Uh, look at the jurors or the judge if it's just a judge there. Uh, pausing to understand the question does not harm you. Um, let me see. And then, I don't know, toward the bottom, when you're in trouble in the courtroom, in other words, you're not quite sure what to say, do not lean back, lean forward. And when you're finished, uh, wait until the judge dismisses you from the witness stand, and then don't leave the courtroom until there's a break. And then make sure the attorney you know, uh, that you're working for allows you to leave. Because you could be called back in later, who knows. As an expert, you could face liability for the side you're working on. So if you hold yourself as, as an expert and later on through a prior uh, you know, contest or, or Daubert challenge, you're thrown out as an expert, that's going to hurt your side. And so depending on which state you live in, you may or may not have immunity. So be careful about this. Uh, the basis for liability, they would say, we're under breach of contract. I had a contract with you to give your opinion in court. You didn't make it to court. You were thrown out. Okay. They might win on this. Negligence. Criminal process. Not sure about that one, but negligence would be a big one. Uh, so again, you want to do a good job. You want to make sure whatever work you do, you report and you make it all the way into the courtroom setting if the case goes that far. Written reports. As an expert, you will have to prepare a report but work with your attorney, and this says don't draft a written report of any kind unless you're directed so by hiring, hiring counsel. That's the attorney who hired you. Okay. So uh, be careful because anything as an expert that you've written down, anything you've done, your work papers, whatever, can be obtained by the other side. So make sure you know when you're supposed to write a report. Um, you have to prepare a report, you know, keep a diary, don't destroy notes. Types of expert reports, can there can be a fact-oriented report. Usually you would not do this if you're an expert, because um, usually you're in the opinion report, the next one. This can be an evaluation report, business damage report. is more subjective, okay? Or it could be a combination of the two. What goes in the report? Well, the... Federal rules of civil procedure say that you know, all opinions will be expressed in the report. The data you relied upon, exhibits, your qualifications, compensation, and a few others on here. And talking more about reports, they're sort of generally organized like this. You'll have the name and docket number of the case. And you saw a couple of these others in the previous slide. Your qualifications, information you considered in formulating your opinions a list of other cases you worked on in the previous four years, your compensation, and then make sure your opinions are clear here. Uh, you, you give the opinions as to the accounting work you're doing. You don't give the opinions as to the other side is guilty or not guilty. You don't state that. That's for the judge and or jury to decide. You will make opinions on the accounting and finance evidence. The last slide here talks about you know, Dalbert and Fry challenges. And this is where, I didn't explain this earlier good enough, the other side tries to throw you off the case as, as someone not qualified to be an expert. So the other side will is, you know, issue this against you. And then there's a hearing in front of the judge, and they'll go through you know, pros and cons about whether you should be on the, the case as an expert or, or not. You don't want to get thrown off here. Make sure you do good work. Make sure you're qualified. Now, it says here in the second point, in March 2015, of 648 subdisciplines, it showed that accounting experts were ranked ninth in most challenged experts behind economists, who were eighth. Now, police were ranked number one, the people trying to get the, the police thrown off the case. But, you know, the accounting experts, you know, they're, they're called in the question here, and they 
or also try to be thrown off the case. Uh, over the past 15 years, lack of reliability was the primary reason for exclusion, in other words, being thrown off the case. When Daubert challenges were appealed, because you can go to the next higher court, the appellate courts have agreed 70% of the time with that expert being thrown off. And then the agreement rate is even lower than that, where the person is a financial expert. That comes from the Price Whitehouse Cooper study, 2014. Okay, that's it for chapter eight, and good luck with your studies.